Welcome to my channel, at least temporarily. <laughs> this is Stephen Anderson, and as I see it, formerly thinking biblically, but uh, in the interest of truth, what I think biblically is my thoughts. Uh, whether they're accurate or not, God will judge. Now, we're going to talk about God's judgment a bit in a little bit of a different thing. Uh, Paul tells us that before the return of Christ, there will come a period of apostasy. Now, only Christians can be apostates. I mean, apostates from Christ. He's not talking about Muslim apostates, where you apostatize from Allah and the Quran and whatever. He's talking about Christians who leave Christ, who leave the gospel for something else. And do we have it in spades today? Uh, the little uh, Nazarene local church is close, one of the, probably one of the closest churches here. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have a good selection. <laughs> there is a, a so-called fundamentalist Baptist church that, that actually I visited again a number of weeks ago and, uh, in the evening, and it's hard to tell whether evening services and morning services are the same. But uh, uh, it was the first part of the service was re refreshing because it's basically traditional Baptist, um, no worship feminine leader group up there, you know, six women and six microphones and two electric guitars and a drum kit. None of that. It was pretty much the same as it was 10 years ago. Same pastor, too, in fact. Uh, the problem was the sermon. And that's why, why I, I think the last time I listened to a sermon of his, I was thinking, what, he, he was talking about Ezekiel and his vision of the um, uh, New Jerusalem, which, of course, is, is, has to be taken spiritually because you can't take that literally. The, the things just don't add up mathematically. But uh, uh, he did, certainly didn't take it literally. He, he, he spiritualized it as in made it into allegory. No allegory is not. Unless the Bible says this is allegorically speaking, you don't go there. As Luther said, allegory is a nose of wax. You can make the Bible say whatever it, whatever you want it to say if you're going to take it allegorically. And the last I visited and he was, I think it was from the New Testament I was, I was listening and, and the, the problem I have is I listen to the sermons. Even I usually bring a Bible so I can have something to read. <laughs> but I can't avoid hearing what's being said, and because I know the Bible fairly well, and I believe God, I believe the Scriptures, and I believe they're sufficient. When somebody twists them to mean something other than what's actually being taught in the section, you know, I, I, it has to be what is being communicated by God to us contextually. You're not allowed to take a verse out of context and use it to say what you want it to say. That's Joel Osteen, and he's going to burn in hell unless he repents. Because the Bible is not, the gospel is not what Joel Osteen preaches. He preaches the, God of the, the, the gospel of health and wealth, which is a false gospel. And if you follow Joel Osteen, well, just be aware. The reason I said, you know, he's part of the, the broad way that leads to destruction. If you follow Joel Osteen and what he currently is teaching, there's always a chance that he may repent, but not likely. You'll end up where he's going. He will be one of those many that stand before Jesus and said, Lord, but I did this and I did this. I did all these wonderful things for you. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, iniquity. Now, just look at his mansion and his property and all his wealth they have and ask the question, is this what Jesus said we're supposed to strive for? Is this what life is about? Stuff. And if you can't answer that question biblically, well... You need to read the Bible. Yes, Jesus did speak about a lot about money, but none of it was very good. It's amazing how they twist that. These these faith preachers, faith, well, faith in faith is what they teach, not faith in God. That's called magic. 
That's called sorcery. That's exactly what witches do. They practice the power of their belief as a way to make their will take place. That's what Joel Osteen and the rest of the health and wealth crowd preach. Sorcery. Witchcraft. I know, I've studied some of that stuff. Looked into it. Is this, what do they really believe? Oh, yeah. It's just like the doctrine of the Church of Satan, the, the one that was out in California many years ago. It is do what you want. Do what you will. That's the whole of the law of Satan. Do what you want. Whatever makes you, pleases you, do it. If that woman pleases you, go rape her. Do it. Do it, do it, do it. You know, you got a voice saying, do it, do it, do it. It's like, okay, time to be gone, Satan. But the problem that I think most Christian churches have no idea what the gospel is. They're preaching false gospels. It's not just Joel Osteen. It's not just Kenneth Copeland. Not that these manifest nonsense things that even the world recognizes as being not quite what Jesus taught. Yeah, nothing to do with Jesus. And at least rather than trying to expose his, their, their excesses, they should get to the point. This is not what Jesus taught. But they don't want to really get that close to Jesus either. But we've got this fantastic end of, end of times apostasy taking place within the church. And the world is uh, doing everything it can to divorce itself from reality itself. Bizarre. You wonder why there's 150 genders? Well, or whoever wants to count them. Because the Bible says there's two. It's a war against God. It's Satan's war against reality itself, because God is the ultimate reality. Without him, there is nothing. It's war against God himself. In the beginning, God made them what? Male and female. That's two genders with a purpose. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, since that's just been a done, pretty much done, I think it's time for the end, the return of Jesus, because the earth is ripe. His harvest has ripened, both the wheat and the tares, or the grapes of wrath. Depending on which book you're looking at. It's all in the Bible. That's what we're up against. We're up against the very edge. The madness has consumed the world. The madness of sin. It's finally run its course, and we're seeing everything we see in the world is crazy is a result of the fall of Adam. The fall of Adam. Now, he was a responsible one. He was the first. He is the head of the race. Eve was taken out of Adam. She was not an independent creation. Neither are you. You were created in Adam. Your DNA is part of the, the permutations that the, the DNA of Adam can spit out. Don't believe what the preachers carelessly speak about, because they're not careful with the truth. It drives me nuts. They don't, they don't, you know, the scriptures, uh, t Paul taught, uh, said to Timothy to be a workman that, that need not be ashamed, accurately dividing the word of truth, or ha what that means is accurately, skillfully handling the Bible. In other words, presenting using the Bible to say what God says in context. Not what you want to say, what God says. And today, and I'm, one of the things that's, that's really on my mind right now is because I've been attending this little local Nazarene church because, well, I was going to say that the, the local Baptist church, which I would probably have, theologically are more, more aligned with, first of all, they're a sect. They're a sect because if you don't hold to dispensationalism, which is nothing but man theory. Bible does not teach dispensationalism. It's a theory developed by, uh, who was that? Uh, well, C.I. Schofield was the popularizer, uh, but the, oh, the guy, the church is, well, the Plymouth Brethren guy. Uh, it doesn't matter right now. Anyway, he developed it in the early part of the 19th century. It's a system of man's interpretation of the Bible. 
It's not what the Bible teaches. Just like Calvinism. It's not what the Bible teaches. It has parts of the Bible. It has some Bible truths. So does dispensationalism. But it is man not being satisfied with what God has written and making their own interpretation the standard. And the, the problem there is, I asked the pastor, I was talking to him, and, <clears throat> and I said, well, I'm not really a dispensationalist. And so, so, then you, you don't belong here. That's what he said. You don't belong here. You'd be more comfortable someplace else. Because you're not going to like what I have to say. That's probably true. Because it's not what the Bible says. Now, I don't hold to reform covenantal theology either. That's a bunch of hooey too, because it's not what the Bible teaches. When you go beyond Scripture, you're outside of the Word of God, outside the authority of God, and if you're teaching that as truth and making that a standard of church membership, guess what? You're a cult. You're a sect. In some ways, I'd be tempted to maybe attend a, a Lutheran church if it was orthodox, but I know that we've got a couple of Missouri Synod churches here. Can't do it. Can't do it. I mean, I might be able to attend, hold my nose, but, well, I don't know that confession. We confess that we are by nature without uh, sinful and unclean, and we think sin against the th by thought word. Wait a minute. If you've been born again, are you truly by nature? Your flesh by nature is sinful and clean. But if you've been born again, if you haven't been born again, you can confess that, but you can't confess that if you've been born again because the new man is without sin. The new nature does not sin. See, I'm too picky. I believe what the Bible says. Anyway, I want to get into imputed righteousness because I suspect that the problem at the church I've been attending, and it's slowly been coming out, I've been like, where's the gospel? I hear a lot of we should do this and we should do that. And last week, apparently they've got a, a fund drive. Twice a year, apparently, the Nazarenes have something they call the alabaster offering. They want you to break your, your vial or precious ointment and give it to them. And, you know, so it's, it's not, I suspect this is a denominationally mandated because in that denomination, you really, the preachers really are the employees of the denomination. They're, they're just a Methodist outshoot, offshoot. And the district superintendent is the bishop. They may not use that word, but that's what he is. And the bishop runs things. And, well, apparently, though, the denomination, you know, they, oh, this is the time of year. You've got to be out there and preach give. Preach giving, preach giving. So he was preaching, uh, started preaching tithing. And said, I, yes, I know some people don't believe this is for the new covenant. And then he gave, went on to give some lame things and referenced the mandatory passage from, uh, what was that in the Old Testament, the Minor Prophets. He didn't quite go on to, you're robbing God if you don't tithe. But, and he acknowledged some people don't agree with it. I made the mistake of being silent. I was really tempted to and afterwards, I regretted it. I should have said, when he said, and some people believe that tithing is not part of the New Testament. I should have said, amen. Because it's not. It's absolutely not. I mean, I've carefully looked into these things. It's not. And it brings a curse upon you. Tithing doesn't bring a blessing. If you are tithing to be right with God, and many preachers will take you to that point, if they start teaching to not tithe is to rob God, then you know that they are leading you to damnation. They don't believe the gospel. They don't understand the gospel. Now, this preacher happened to be raised as a Nazarene. So I don't call, hold him to quite as high a standard. But nevertheless, I, I'm going to have to be ask him, what do you believe about imputed righteousness? Because this, the... the all this other stuff underlies it. Why haven't I been hearing the gospel about Christ's finished work and all that we have in him? Why do I keep hearing, you know, let's, we need to, to ask the Holy Spirit to come and bless us. We need to ask God to be present. No, why don't you believe the Bible? The Bible says, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I also. Do you believe it or not? Apparently they don't. He doesn't teach it. So he apparently doesn't believe it. Or doesn't 
See, of course, this is Wesleyan. The holiness movements are basically are Wesleyan. Not necessarily all of them, but typically. The, the Methodist, Nazarene, uh, Salvation Army, uh, the various other various Wesleyan groups, they all come from John Wesley. And John Wesley did not hold to Scripture alone. He added tradition and reason and experience to the Bible as the authority. Well, that's why they are where they are today. The Nazarenes no longer believe their flagship doctrine, by the way. They don't preach it. The Nazarene theologians <laughs> don't believe it. In fact, I've got their principal theology book, uh, Holiness Theology, and I want to say, okay, is there something in the Bible that I've missed? By a guy named Greider, by the way, who was threatened with expulsion if he revealed some of the things he believed. A defrocking. Uh, that's all available on the Internet. But uh, let's see, do I have that book here? Probably do, but can I find it? I've got too many books. That's the problem. Uh. No, not covenantal. There he is. Oh, there it is. A Wesleyan holiness theology. There are very few Wesleyan, Methodist, Arminian books on theology. Calvinism, you can find them by the spades. Uh, because this, this isn't about theology. But I thought, well, maybe, maybe a Grider here, J. Kenneth Grider, who was, in fact, a heretic, uh, I thought, well, maybe he can show me in the Scripture where they get their their uh, sinless perfectionism from, that doctrine. And he gives one verse and is totally abused. It's just like the, the, the verse of the, the uh, prosperity teachers, uh, I wish above all things you, that you may prosper and be in good health. In a personal letter written to a specific individual, uh, and prosperity as in have a successful journey and that you may not get sick and die on the way, you know, and a greeting to it on a personal letter. And they use that as the scriptural basis, and that's about the same as the, the, the foundation for the scriptural basis of the, uh, the, the sinless perfectionism, at least from what he, I can't remember the exact verse here, and I'm not going to do a message on this per se, but... It, it, it's no foundation at all, because Wesley didn't care. He was not careful to abide in the Scripture, because he didn't believe the Scripture was the only authority. So it's just like Rome. Well, you know, in, in, in the basic elements that go all the way back to the beginning, Rome was an Orthodox church, but it's the stuff that's been added that's a problem. It's the Mariolatry and the... And the uh, transubstantiation of the bread and the wine, all those things were added, often a thousand years or more later. And a lot of it is not, even to this day, is not official doctrine. It's like the, so, you know, bef at one point, for example, the, tr the transubstantiation, in other words, the, the bread and the wine really change into the body and blood of and the, and the soul and divinity. Let's be careful here to make it, see how clear it is, of Jesus. This is my blood. They take that as a, as a but, but it's all an Aristotelian uh, metaphysics, which means nothing. See, that's all junk. That's all garbage. That is how the world, that's how Aristotle thought, what was it? How many years B.C.? What did he know about reality? as far as, you know, the physical nature of things. Nothing. You're just making it up. They didn't know, even know about atoms. They didn't know about elements. They didn't know about any of that. They thought, you know, uh, air, fire, water, and what was the other? And earth. That was, everything was made out of those four things, according to them. They knew nothing. They were ignorant. He was a pagan. He was doubly ignorant, triply ignorant. Without God, you don't know anything. And all the all these stuff in theology, uh, Aris, not only Aristotle but uh, Augustine got a lot of his theology from Aristotle, 
and the followers, the, the assorted followers of the, like the uh, neo uh, Platonists and the uh, Neoplatonism and these other things, and he studied all that before he became became a Christian. Well, he just taught what he wanted to teach. He did not restrict himself to the clear teaching of the Bible, and that wasn't how the Bible was preached in those days anyway. It was more moralism and and uh, Arist or Augustine taught the interpretive method of the, you know, the, the symbols and types and everything else rather than the, the message conveyed by the context. They thought that was elementary and wasn't worth mentioning. You know, that wasn't sophisticated enough. They needed that nose of wax so they could shape the scripture to say what they want. Baptist preachers do it all the time. That's why I won't go to that church over there. Do I like the church? Do I like the worship? Pretty much. I can tolerate that. But the preaching that that the preacher says, well, this represents this and this represents that and whatever, and I'm sitting there, where? Show me, where? He just says those things. John MacArthur does the same thing, by the way. That's why I cannot stand his preaching either. And it's only when you start listening to it carefully, that, where does he get this from? From John MacArthur. <clears throat> All right. So imputed righteousness. And this is why I got to question this preacher about this church I attend. What is your position on imputed righteousness? And I don't think Nazarenes basically believe in imputed righteousness. I mean, a lot of times you don't look into things carefully in advance. It's like, I had two years of lockdown. I couldn't do it the, anything at the nursing home anymore. So you finally get back to church. It's like, ah. And then you start listening, and after you know nine months or so, it's like, wait a minute, where's the gospel? Where's the gospel? I'm wondering, do these people know what the gospel is? Not going to hear it from from the guy that's there. Apparently, apparently, I mean, you know, coming to Christ and asking Christ to forgive you is not the gospel. The, the, God loves you is not the gospel. Because and the other thing is they don't present God as He really is. First of all, the Bible presents God as holy. The angels in heaven sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And as I've been thinking about this and realizing, hey, there's something not quite right here. It's why is this? And I was thinking of Wesleyanism and, ism and uh, sinless perfectionism. It's self-righteousness. The concern of Wesley was more focused on our individual righteousness than Christ's righteousness. If you stand before God in your own righteousness, you will be damned. Because you don't measure up. Jesus said, therefore, be ye perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. He was preaching about the law. See, the law has to bring you to despair. When it brings you to despair and points you to Christ, because Christ is mentioned in the law, that's, it's fulfilled its purpose. That's why the writer of Hebrews talks about the law being obsolete, because something better has come. The new covenant, the eternal covenant has come. You know, there's a, a word for Christ in the Old Covenant, uh, Old Testament. You know, uh, uh, the word Yeshua, Jesus, means salvation. Joshua it means salvation. God saves. But there's another word, Yatsikeno. You know, Yahshua, God, Yah, Yahweh, saves. Shua is saves, or salvation. There's another word in the Old Testament that's for Christ. You should be known by the name Yatsikeno. Yatsikeno. Now, I'm probably butchering that because I, I don't know any Hebrew, but uh, 
very little, very little Greek. Uh, as far as it's like, you know, it's like some things you can read it. I, yeah, reading Spanish, I can sort of do that, but speaking it, not so well. But Yatsikenu, God, our righteousness. He is our righteousness. And that's what I need to talk about. This might be fairly lengthy because we're going to go into the scripture. But this is a very serious matter. Read the book of Galatians. I told the pastor last week, and I was thinking, how do I say something to this guy? And I said, I said, Pastor, every preacher should read the book of Galatians twice because he was a year. Because he was preaching the law. He was preaching tithing and trying to justify it by the Old Testament. We're not under the Old Testament which means he doesn't understand the relationship between the law and the gospel, which means he doesn't understand the gospel, or God, or sin, or salvation. Okay, now I have, I have the, the easy believism stuff, I have serious issues with this, because salvation is not just justification, but justification God's justifying sinners, not our justifying ourselves through our works, but our being justified through Christ's works is the foundation for all of salvation. There can be no sanctification without that. There can be no indwelling of the Holy Spirit without that. If the Holy Spirit would come into a person apart from them being justified through Christ's death, they would suffer the fate of the two sons of Aaron. Instant incineration. The holy God cannot dwell in an unclean vessel without Christ justifying you, cleansing you, atoning for your sins. There is no way you can have a relationship with God other than a relationship of condemned criminal and judge. So let's, Galatians chapter 5, got to start there, then we got to go to Romans chapter 4. Oh, man. Come on, do what I told you to do. No, it's not going to do it. I'll do it manually here. Stand fast, there, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Now, he's talking about the, the church in Galatia had been deceived by a group of people he, that Paul called Judaizers. In other words, people trying to bring you back under the law of Moses. They, they blended the Christ and the law together, like so many do today. Uh, the Hebrew Roots Movement, it, it, basically Christ is just a, uh, an appendix to Fortunately, they pretty much killed themselves off, as I said they would. One of their principal leaders ended up in prison, as I said they would. So what happens. The law stirs up sin. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. He's talking about the law as a yoke of bondage. The yoke of the law. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, if you become circumcised. See, that they were being taught by the Judaizers that to be a Christian, you had to also be circumcised. And circumcision actually goes back to Abraham, not just to Moses. So, you know, you could, you could work to justify that and twist it so that it'd be believable, but it's not right. Christ will profit you nothing. You hear that? If you, in other words, if you're trying to be justified by keeping the, God's commandments, if you think your relationship with God is because you try to keep his commandments, Christ will profit you nothing. And almost every church of Christ I've ever attended, never attended very much, but fits into that category. It's just like so much of, of uh, you know, like the, the followers of, of Charles Finney. Finney said, you have to stand before God in your own righteousness. Well, then you're dead. Then you're damned. Then you're going to hell. Because you don't measure up to God's holiness, to God's perfection, to what God commands. If you don't keep all the law, always, you are damned. 
That's what it requires. It's not a half-hearted attempt to keep some of the commandments. That profits you nothing. So it's either Christ or your own righteousness. Did Christ measure up? Yes. Do you? No. I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised. He is obeying a commandment of the law. This, in this case, it was circumcision. That he is a debtor to keep the whole, the entire law. All of it. If you want to be justified by the law, you've got to keep all of it, all the time. No exceptions, no mistakes, no errors, no, no weakness, no accidents. You've got to be perfect to be justified before God by righteousness. If you don't have perfect righteousness, you're not justified. You have become estranged from Christ. The Galatians had become estranged, separated from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. And I can say the same thing about water baptism to the Church of Christ and to many others. If you think water baptism saves you, it avails nothing but faith working through love. Verse 9, a little leaven leavens a whole lump. Read the whole thing. Read the whole book. It's only about five or six, only, what is it, five chapters long, I think. Now I've got to look. Oh, it's only five chapters. should be able to do that in like an hour. Okay, let's go back to Romans. Justified by imputed righteousness, reckoned righteousness, a righteousness that God counts toward us that doesn't belong to us. Uh, sometimes it's called alien righteousness, as, in, as opposed to intrinsic righteousness, or extrinsic, I suppose you could call that. In other words, it's not our righteousness, it's somebody else's righteousness that's imputed to us. Starting at chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The law condemns everyone. And that's part of God's purpose. We all start on equal grounds. See, God chose to put everyone under sin. We're born under sin. That he might show grace, mercy to all. It's on the basis of faith, not our works, God's works. Therefore, by the deeds of law, you see, actually the law has been added. The deeds of law, you know, trying, obey, uh, you're trying to obey, no flesh will be justified in his sight. No human being. No natural human beings, Christ being an exception, because he was not born of Adam. His mother was of Adam, but his father was God. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law tells you you're a sinner, you've broken God's law. It tells you what's right and wrong and then reveals that you're not right. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law. Now he's talking about being justified before God. He's talking about the law. The righteousness is being right with God. What is right is righteousness. The property of being right with God. Now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. They speak of it even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. So this righteousness is through faith, for there's no difference. For all have sinned 
and fall short of the glory of God. Well, the glory of God is what man was created to, to bear. That was what the sin does. It, it, you don't bear the glory of God anymore. The glory, man was created to be the image of God. When Adam fell, he wasn't the image of God, God's intended purpose anymore. He didn't bear the holiness and righteousness and grace and mercy and justice of God anymore. He became self-centered instead of in relationship to God, centered on God. For all of sin and fall short of the glory, being justified, just to be justified is to be you know, when you're before the judge and the judge says not guilty. The judge does not say, I forgive you. The God's the judge says not guilty. Under the law. Freely by his grace through the redemption. That is the buying back. To redeem something is to, to buy it back. That is in Christ Jesus. What, what had to be bought back from? Well, the violation of the law. Sin. Sin against the law. Whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood. In other words, a satisfaction to the law. See, the problem is the law. The, the violations of the law is has to be dealt with, that God might be both just and the justifier. God can't just simply forgive you. He's already said you're guilty. He already gave a law. You violated it. What are you going to do about that? Well, the penalty of the law is death. death. If you do not keep all the commandments, the penalty is death. So that's not fair. Well, God had a remedy in mind. Who, who, uh, who was set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate, now he always throws it through faith in here, to demonstrate his righteousness. In other words, God's righteousness, his rightness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over sins that, previous, that were previously committed. In other words, in the past, God didn't punish everybody like David. Under the law, David was supposed to be executed. God sort of overlooked it, but not merely overlooked it, in mind of what he would accomplish in Christ. So there's other onlockers to that. You have the angelic beings that God has created that are saying, wait a minute, how can God simply overlook what, what uh, David did with Bathsheba and to what David had her, her uh, husband killed to cover up his own sin? How can God simply overlook that? Well, he didn't simply overlook it, but he didn't carry out the letter of the law either. Why? Because God had a solution to that problem that was not going to be revealed for about a thousand years. So the angels might have had to scratch their heads for a thousand years. What's going on here? Now, actually, it's more than that because you can go all the way back to the beginning. If all is sin, that means that... Uh, Enoch sinned too. Yet he didn't see death. Nor did, uh, uh, who else was that? Uh, my brain is going bad. The, what, all the prophets. <laughs> uh, let's see, what was the prophet's name? It doesn't matter. <clears throat> the one that was taken up in a chariot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll come to me in about 30 seconds. Now it's bothering me. Oh, my. One of the curses of getting old, I guess. The way... Yeah, my body's dying. My brain is dying. <clears throat> to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. In other words, at that time, Paul, God had demonstrated his righteousness that he might be just. He himself paid the penalty for David's sin on the cross. God in Christ shed his, took, took the sentence of death that was on David. Now that's relevant here. 
so that God might be just in having satisfied the requirements of his own commandments and also might have mercy to justify the one who has faith in Jesus. In other words, to declare David, because David believed in Christ, he wrote about him, the Messiah, that he might declare him to be innocent, blameless, because Christ was blameless. Whereas boasting then is excluded by what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith, faith in Jesus Christ, not faith alone. I want to be clear about that. Faith alone in Jesus Christ, apart from the deeds of the law, apart from the keeping the commandments. You're justified apart from works of obedience. See, without this, because no matter how good you are, you're not good enough. You've already broken the law. It's not just the Ten Commandments. That was only the introduction. The real ones come later. Those were the ABCs, the 10 ABCs. There's like 613 commandments in total. At least that's how the, the Jews enumerate them, I guess. But there's really two. Everything hangs on two. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Let me add all the time. Otherwise, you're not keeping it. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself, the same way you love yourself. And you're not keeping that. So if you're, and if you've ever broken those, you're under the sentence of death, according to the law. Who's out there is innocent? Sinless perfectionism is a lie of the devil. You wouldn't believe what Wesley did to try to justify it. He just diluted sin down into meaninglessness. Wesley was... Well, I would not want to gamble on his salvation, I'll tell you that. I don't know if he ever understood the gospel. I know when he was in the 60s, he wrote a letter to his brother Charles saying that he was, uh, that he'd never been a Christian. He's always been nothing but a, an honest heathen, and I would contest that. He's not actually a heathen, nor is he honest. But then he goes on to say, but if, if this is true of me, how could I have done all these mighty works for God? Well, that's, Jesus said, many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, did I not do all these great things for you? Did I not build a heritage village, you know, Jim, Jimmy Baker, or, uh, you know, whatever other great things? Did I not build this great church and all this stuff and created a Bible with my name on it, all for you? Wrote many books with my name plastered all over the front, even though I didn't write them. All for you, Lord. And I will say to them, Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. So if it depends on your works and your perfection, and you, you try to justify yourself by what you've done, guess what? You're going to be judged as a lawbreaker, a sinner, and go under the penalty of the law. Therefore we conclude, verse 28, a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles, non-Jews? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised Jews by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or not. It's whether you have faith in Christ. Do we make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. In other words, we don't void the law so that the law doesn't 
have its penalty, but the law is fulfilled in Christ. The penalty is carried out on Christ that God can both be just and the justifier of sinners, declaring sinners innocent. Because of what Christ did. Paid, well, it's not exactly saying they didn't commit it. It's saying the bill, the, the, the penalty of breaking the law has been paid in full on the cross by Christ. Romans chapter 4, getting down to it now, I had to get, I have some things, I hate to leave anything out here. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham, according to his natural, the flesh, usually Paul means uh, <coughs> natural man as a descendant of Adam. For if Adam, for if Abraham is justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So it, it, Abraham, now the law hadn't even come yet. If he's justified by his work, somebody's going to bring up James. Well, I just say, well, you don't understand James nor Paul then. <laughs> he's talking about not justified before men, but justified before God. And f faith being justified by its works. In other words, faith being demonstrated by works that are in accordance with faith. That, that's a whole different thing. That's the fruit of faith. That's not the same thing as works as a basis for salvation before God. Two different things. For if Abraham is justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Now, even then, because why? You couldn't do it unless God enabled you to do it anyway. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. God made a promise to Abraham. Abraham believed God. And God said, Abraham's righteous because he believed me. Again, God looking forward to the cross. That's why Jesus said to some people, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. In other words, Abraham in in uh, paradise, I didn't say heaven, I said paradise, saw Christ coming. In other words, he's there, he's observing it, and rejoiced because he knew Christ was his salvation. Now, paradise now is empty. Christ took captivity captive. You could think of paradise in the modern prison thing is you have maximum security prison, and then you have these other prisons that are sort of like confined resorts. <laughs> That's a little exaggeration, but you know what I'm talking about. These minimum security, maximum liberty, other than you can't leave kind of things. Not barbed wire and breaking stone kind of stuff. The other kind. So it just is for the people that aren't judged exceedingly bad. So Abraham, so uh, the reckoning was that, that hell had two compartments, death, the abode of the dead had two compartments. Uh, um, Tartarus, which was where the wicked dead were punished, and and paradise was where the, the good dead were rewarded, but they were still confined. <clears throat> so when the Bible talks about uh, paradise, it's not talking about heaven. So those are two different concepts. Heaven is the abode of God. See, in, in paradise, Abraham was not in direct communion with God. He couldn't be because Christ had not yet been sacrificed. His sins hadn't been atoned for. He was reckoned, he was counted as righteous in view of the coming atonement. Now, the atonement's at pass for us. So we don't have to be uh, wait for it to come. It's already been done. It's completed. 2,000 years ago, Christ atoned for the sins of the world. Now back to Abraham. Now, verse 4, Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Gr grace is a free gift. 
It's not a, a debt. A wage, your employer owes you your wage. If he just gives you something, it's not your wage. You have to earn a wage. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, the God who justifies the ungodly. That's a scandalous expression. His faith is accounted, is reckon, accounted to him, reckoned to him given to him for righteousness. It's, it's because he believes God, God reckons him as righteous. Because he believes in Christ, God reckons him as righteous. That's justification through faith. Just, with a, a righteousness is not our own. Everything else is works. I, as as uh, one man in a nursing home said, I, I think I'm probably going to go to heaven because I, I was at church every Sunday. Then he said, well, almost every Sunday. And I gave offerings. And then he goes on to recount how as a little boy he stole the pennies from God. <laughs> it's like, oh, man, these poor people. Church of Christ. See, Church of Christ is works. It works. You're justified by your obedience. You're toast. They have no gospel. I, I can rejoice every time a traditional Church of Christ building closes. And thank, thankfully they're closing. But then the Nazarenes are going out of business, too. So that's also a good thing. Because apparently they don't have the gospel either. Or the Methodists, or pretty much the apostasy is here, brothers and sisters. The apostasy is here. See, back when I got saved, I mean, I was, there was all kinds of people in the military and uh, where I was going to school that were, that do Jesus. They were born again. They were... They understood that Christ died for my sins, and because of that, I'm I'm right with God. I don't think people know that anymore. I don't think they they they, they might know it in in head knowledge, but they don't actually believe it. I mean, it's not what could be called saving faith. It's it's not the. You know, when you when God reveals that Christ died for your sins and you're not guilty, he died for all your sins, past, present, and future, that probably scandalized the Nazarenes, too. Can't help it. God said it. <laughs> that was a personal re revelation, and it's in complete accordance with the Bible. If it wasn't, I'd have to throw out that revelation. But no, that's what saved me. The Holy Spirit revealed to me that Christ died for my sins. That was like, Wow. I was under conviction, I put it that way. And it was like, wow. Changed my whole life. Didn't make me sinlessly perfect. I don't need to be sinlessly perfect. Christ was. All these silly people out there striving for sinless perfectionism. Well, they used to be, they're not so many anymore. They all died off. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, oh, I see that's not working now. Uh, it worked for a moment. <laughs> uh, Windows and its upgrades. Or OBS and its upgrades. Anyway, uh, yeah. I mean, back then, I mean, there, there was a, a, a movement among youth called the Jesus Revolution or the Jesus Freaks or whatever. And in reality, God got a hold of, of many young people and it was outside the church. The churches weren't responsible for it. Uh, the church, some of the churches tried to get help and bring some of these people in. That's where Calvary Chapel really originated in uh, the Jesus movement. But some of the the people that were leaders of that movement weren't ever <laughs> ever saved. Uh, a guy named Frisbee. It turned out he was a lifelong homosexual and and uh, drug abuser, alcoholic. Well. The Bible would say, put him out of the church because it's obvious he's not saved. Say, God expects, say, God, having laid the foundation of your justification, God gives you the Holy Spirit and begins the work of sanctifying you. Now, there is, you are set apart. You've been purchased by Christ, so you're sanctified in that sense. You now belong to God. But he, get, he begins a work of work in you, too, changing your heart. Uh, adjusting your affections, 
convicting you of your sin, things like that. But your sins are paid for. Your, your standing with God depends on Christ justifying you. Otherwise, he couldn't do anything with you because he's holy and you're utterly guilty and evil and dark. Before God can even begin to renovate the house, he's got to buy it. So, just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. In other words, it has nothing to do with keeping the commandments. This is a law that has nothing to do with your works, your good deeds, or your bad deeds. Blessed, verse 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. He's quoting from the Psalms, David. And whose sins are covered. I'm glad they use words like covered rather than simply forgiven. Because it doesn't deny this, that it was not simply an arbitrary act of God, but rather a pain for your sin. It was not, um, what do you call it in the legal system in the United States? Uh, can't remember at the moment. But, it's, you know, when it would, they decide to let somebody go, uh, loose uh, rather than, than declaring them not guilty. In this case, the guilt has been removed because it was placed on Christ. Now, if you don't understand this, <clears throat> again, this is a hard concept to understand, simply because we're so wedded to the idea of self-righteousness and self-guilt, <clears throat> that, that God, that Christ could die for our sins. Now, he died for sin in the whole, but it only applies to those that believe. <clears throat> this limited atonement other than the sense that's restricted to believers, uh, of um, Calvinism is to be discarded. It's simply because people over there did not understand the Bible either. They looked outside the Bible to places like their own logic and reason. I mean, Christ paid for your sins, and obviously you're saved whether or not you're saved or not, right? That's nonsense. The Bible teaches that we're saved by Christ atonement through faith in it, through faith in Christ. <clears throat> so if you want to put forward a theology that disagrees with the Bible, well, I have a place for your theology, and it's called the trash can. Does, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? Or upon the uncircumcised also. For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. When, how was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not well. See, what, what Paul's are talking about here is, is this simply for the Jews? Or is it for the, the Gentiles, the non-Jews also? And he's making the case here that it's for the non-Jews also because Abraham was not circumcised when he was accounted as righteous. And God gave, and then it says, verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of faith, which he had uh, still had uh, while he, he had while still uncircumcised. See, circumcision is a reminder that, it's supposed to be a reminder, that you're righteous through faith. And they turned it into righteousness through the commandment of circumcision. It was a reminder. It's just like baptism. Water baptism is a reminder that you've, that you've made a commitment to Christ, that you've made a confession of faith in Christ, and not a secret confession either. So it's a sign of faith, but it is not the substance of faith. The, the, you're actually saved prior to that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be a candidate for baptism. <sighs> And you wonder why Bible believers don't believe in infant baptism, because it doesn't fit the Scriptures. If you don't believe, you can't be baptized. 
Baptism doesn't save you. Which is another reason I can't be a loser. No. Yeah, you can agree. See, you can always find things you agree with. And then you find the things you don't agree with and say, really? Could I swallow this? Nope. Can't swallow that one. Some people downplay that, but... You know, if a person's been baptized as an infant and they don't see the need to be baptized as a, as a believer, well, I don't really have a problem. But if they say that they are saved because they're baptized as an infant, then I've got a problem. Do you have real living faith in Christ? Is he your atonement? Is he your perfection? Is he your righteousness? Is he your Lord and your God and your Savior? If not, then that water they sprinkled you with didn't do anything. As I can say, it didn't work for me. How many years did I spend as a practicing sinner? Well, let's see. It was just about my 21st birthday when I got saved. Practicing sinner. I believed in God, but that's not the, that doesn't save you. See, the belief in, that God exists, the belief that the Bible is true, uh, the belief in the Ten Commandments, the belief in the church, being a member of the church. I was a member of a Lutheran church. I mean, by that, I mean I was baptized and confirmed there. And as soon as I got confirmed, they called me up on the phone and wanted to know how much I was going to tithe. I had a paper out. I mean, you, you get confirmed back then, like in the end of ninth grade. First thing they wanted was my money, which I had almost none of. <sighs> Needless to say, that did not get me off on the right foot with the church. Yeah, being confirmed was freedom from the church. I didn't have to go anymore. Because my parents, as long as I got confirmed, as long as I got that far, they, they were not terribly concerned <clears throat> whether I went or not. They always encouraged me to go, but I mean, if I said, I don't feel like it, they'd pretty much leave me alone. Not that they wouldn't encourage me to go next time. But, I mean, the, the thing, see, let's see, what was my experience? With Lutherans, it's sacramental often. Uh, it is going to communion that gets you the forgiveness for the sins you committed the last two weeks. At least then it was often every other Sunday at that particular church. It's a lot like Roman Catholicism, really. Lutheranism is like old Roman Catholicism. See, if you, if you went back to, well, Augustine. Ah. Uh, So, where was I? But with David here, blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. David was well aware of his guilt under the law and the fact that he was under a sentence of death. But God did not account that to him at that time because God looked forward to the cross. Now, that means God was... <laughs> Don't ask uh, uh, counterfactuals. Finally understood what that means. Like, well, what happened if Jesus hadn't died on the cross? Well, then David would be in hell. That's where... That's what would have happened. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, Jesus said. That's why... You know, this is, we have to understand that we live on the, the better side of the cross. We don't have to go to Jerusalem and offer sheep three times a year. Nor do we have to pay a tithe of 10% of the increase of the ground. So if you're not a farmer, basically the tithe does not apply to you or a rancher. See, it was on the increase of the crops and the livestock. That's what the tithe was on. If you were a potter, 
You didn't pay the tithe. If you were, you know, a skilled craftsman or a fisherman, well, fish, no, fishermen, there would be a tithe, I think. Depends how perstickety you want to be. But it, it was, see, because when it comes to, say, agriculture, or the produce of the land, that is uh, something that God directly provides. So it's basically giving God his 10% commission for actually giving you the 100% that you got. Sort of like rental fee, usage fee. If you're using my property to produce food, I want part of it back. But that's... Uh, then, Paul, let me get down here. Um, so, Paul here is talking about the circumcision was... Abraham was, circ was circumcised after he was counted for righteousness. In other words, circumcision doesn't make you righteous. Verse 14, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise of no effect. See, we're saved by God's promise. We're saved by God, not by our works, God. God did the work. God made it possible. All we do is believe what God said. Now, a lot of people believe lots of things, but not what... You know, it's like people... The scripture says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But it's in the context of salvation. Are you calling upon God to save you from your sin and its consequences? Or are you God calling to save you from something else, like save me from my circumstances? That's not of any value at all. You, you have to call upon God to save you from your sin and the consequences of sin, from the wrath of God, to reconcile you to him. In other words, it fix you for giving yourself over to God so God can do an overhaul job on you. But to do that, first of all, he has to deal with this huge debt you have called sin. And that has to be, that's God's work. God pays the debt in Christ with his own blood. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand the gospel at all. That is the foundation. You can't, <clears throat> you can't begin to talk about sanctification and, the, and the, all, the promise, all the other promises of the new covenant without justification being the, the foundation of it all. And you can never get past this. Our whole life as Christians and whole eternity depends on it. And there's never a... a the cross of Jesus Christ is never taken out of the way. It's never gone. You know, looking at, some ways when I look at, say, Roman Catholicism today, I have to say it's, it's much more orthodox in some ways than evangelicalism, because evangelicalism has totally forgotten the cross, deliberately, all these church growth movements and everything else, uh, <clears throat> you know, people like Rick Warren and others, deliberately take the cross out because they're trying to appeal to the world on the world's terms. That's why they have worldly latest you know, text or country western gospel songs <clears throat> for worship, rather than true, you know, great hymns of praise to God. They don't want that. They don't want God-centeredness. It's all man-centered. Rick Warren's another one that I, that I account is not saved <clears throat> because there's no evidence he understood the gospel at all. His purpose-driven life is anything but the gospel. It's all about you, your purpose, your happiness, your, sex, your, your success, <clears throat> simply like John Piper. All about John Piper, his whole theology is built around John Piper and John Piper's happiness. God is a way to my happiness, <clears throat> which means he's uh, probably not going to find that. John Piper can talk about all kinds of stuff, but thank thankfully he's 
pretty much retired now. But Christian hedonism, you know, that very subtitle says this is a heretical book. And it was. It was using God for your own happiness. That's the message I got out of it. And that's why it was so popular. How to use God to be happy. Well, guess what? We don't use God. God will not be used for our ends. Piper made it very clear in his introduction that Piper had an overwhelming lust, which is a proper word. He didn't use it. Desire he used. But, the, you know, a strong desire is called lust. A lust for his own personal happiness because happiness was a bad thing, apparently, in the church that he was raised in. Well, for an unregenerate person, say a teenager or a young man, I, I would say, yeah, that sounds... It's not about God's happiness, it's about mine. See, that's Adam, the race of Adam. Unredeemed Adam is self-centered. Fallen Adam is self-centered. So if you write a book that says God is pleased with your self-centeredness, sounds like Adam Smith. No. No, there, there's something wrong there. But you, you have to, it, unless you're justified, by, unless you have a righteousness <clears throat> that's given you, unless Christ's righteousness, his perfect righteousness, is counted toward you, unless you, you're in him rather than in your flesh, standing on your own righteousness, you, you, you can't even approach God. Unless the cross is there, the, the very idea of you coming to God to, to beg him to save you is impossible. There is no way to get rid of your sin. There was nothing under the law. There was no, uh, there was no sacrifice under the law for deliberate, willful violations. <clears throat> so, let's say you know the commandment. You're, you're a young kid, you know the commandment, thou shalt not steal, but you steal something. There's no sacrifice for that. Young kid's a little different situation because that's your parents. <laughs> but... <clears throat> They're supposed to offer sacrifices for the family. But, again, there, there's actually, for a willful violation, uh, the, the, the animal sacrifice is only covered <clears throat> for uh, sins committed in ignorance. See, it was, it was a hopeless situation. Humanity's fall into sin was hopeless. It took God to remedy it. Elijah, he's the one that went up in the chariot. <laughs> It always comes slowly. But Elijah, without God looking forward to the cross, Elijah would be like everybody else. Only one end, and that's hell. Gehenna. The garbage dump. Well, I hope I've been able to make somewhat clear the absolute need for justification by faith alone. <clears throat> faith in Christ alone. An imputed justification, an imputed righteousness. If you think your relationship with God depends on what you do rather than what Christ did, then you better be concerned that you may, may have cut yourself off from Christ. When you have a preacher that's preaching moralism, or again, because tithing is so, uh, so evident so many places, where they, <clears throat> they, they use this now that the preacher I'm, I have to deal with as far as that's where I'm attending, 
did not go so far as to say you're robbing God. But he did mention that scripture. Didn't read that portion of it, but he did mention that. And any preacher that, and I've, I've heard preachers do this, more than one, is trying to put a guilt trip on people for not tithing, not giving 10% of your income. They totally ignore the Old Testament laws on tithing altogether because they don't care. All they're interested in is getting the money and doing whatever it takes to get it. They're not serving God. They're thieves. They're false shepherds, hirelings. That's why they love money. They're doing it for the money. And to, to uh, abuse the Bible by threatening people with uh, damnation for not giving 10% of their income, which is not what the tithe is on anyway. It's not on your income. It's on the, the, the fruitfulness of the land. Then you're a servant of Satan, a Judaizer which are leading people to damnation rather than preaching the gospel. Well, at least that's how I see it. Search the scripture and find if that's so or not.